You know, it's written in the book of Isaiah that uh, the nations eventually will go and surround Jerusalem and fight against Jerusalem. And it seems that this week they have started, but they began in, in New York, in the United Nations. Doesn't matter what Israel did, didn't do, or whatever it is, but what we see in front of us, are, these are prophecies that are being fulfilled. Prophecies of the end time, especially as Israel is being isolated more and more as we go deeper or closer to the tribulation or closer to the rapture. The rapture, by the way, this is the subject of today's uh, study. If you have your Bible with you, you can turn to Leviticus chapter 23. I'm going to tell you this is the time of the year when the fall feast of Israel begin. Today we'll look at and celebrate together the great feast of trumpet, Yom Teruah, an important festival in Judaism, one of the many feasts where Jews are called to gather, to pray, and to rejoice. During this feast, the synagogues are filled with songs, and especially with many trumpet or shofar sounds. On this day, they will blow a total of 100 trumpet blasts, or various types of notes, to mark Yom Teruah. What is the significance of this feast? And why the shofar sound? Why does it call us? To what does it call us to see? What does it call us to see and to prepare ourselves for? First, looking at the feast of Israel as God gave the Jews in Leviticus 23, we can see that these mark and divide times in the year, period of time when an individual may stop his work and rest. Because these are called also Shabbats. They are given to us to rest. These feast functions as rest areas when one can look back, one can look forward, and one can look up to the things of God and reassess his place here in this world in light of eternity. This, I believe, is one significant function of the Feast of Israel. Stop, rest, and taste how good our Lord is. The worries, the stress of this life will often pull us away and even make us forget the great things that God wants us to enjoy. These feasts are here like windows to eternity to remind us that there is another world out there, another world that is waiting for us. And even more importantly, these feasts speak of the Messiah. Each bring out a facet of his ministry, of his work that he performed for you, for us. On the road to Emos, when the Messiah was walking along two individuals who wanted to know about him, we read in Luke 24, 27, he says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Beginning at Moses, that is the beginning with Genesis, with the Torah, with the five book of Moses of the Bible where the feast of Israel are found. He began to tell them about things concerning himself. And I want to tell you, if there's a passage in the scriptures that really brings out the Messiah, it is in the feast of Israel. And this is what we will attempt to do today. Find the Messiah in the feast of Israel and especially in the feast of Yom Teruah. Let's turn again to Leviticus 23 and read what it says about this feast. I'll put it on the screen for you also. You know, you will probably be surprised that only three verses are given to us and very scanty information. But behind this mystery, because I want to tell you this is a mystery feast, behind this mystery lies a great truth. Let's read verses 23 to 25. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Shabbat rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Well, these verses do not say much about this feast. And really, this is the only information we have on Yom Teruah. You know, Numbers 9, 1 to 6 also speaks about it, but there are, only list, there are only listed the different sacrifices that are required on this day. What we read in Leviticus 23, 24 is that it is a memorial of blowing of trumpet. A memorial of what? It doesn't say. Furthermore, it, does, it doesn't say what kind of trumpet the Israelites did use. 
Is it the shofar or is it the brass trumpets? Both were blown in Israel. And it is a holy convocation for what purpose? We're not told. This is a really a mystery feast. How are we going to understand it? The rabbis did fill up the gap, but they do not all agree on how to explain the void. Something it was in memory of the wars the Israelites had with the Amalekites and the Canaanites and the victories they, o they obtained against them. Others stressed the remembrance of the walls of Jericho falling down at the sound of the ram's horn. Others remembered the binding of Isaac on Mount Moriah and the ram being sacrificed instead of Isaac because they didn't have the lamb yet, right? The lamb was to come. So they chose ram's horns instead of brass trumpet for the shofar. Many other connect Yom Teruah with the next feast of the Day of Atonement and speak of it as a preparation for this feast. They say that on Rosh Hashanah, all the inhabitants of the world pass before God in judgment like a flock of sheep. All this is fine. There's nothing wrong in adding beautiful thoughts to a truth. And there's something else that this passage tells us. Something very important was actually changed, a change that greatly influenced modern Judaism. Verse 24 says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, the how many month it says? The seventh month. As a Jew going to Hebrew school in my youth, I was always taught that Yom Teruach was the new year. This is why the rabbis call it Rosh Hashanah. I never knew of Yom Teruach. I only knew of Rosh Hashanah. Again, it's okay if you want to add different traditions to the feast and give different explanations of the things that were not explained. It is okay to embellish the word of God. I would even say that it's okay to change the seventh month for the first month so long as you do not endure the word of God. But in this case, changing the new year to the seventh month greatly contributed to blur the reasons why God chose the new year to be the month of Nisan, that is in March and April. And once you blur one part of the scriptures, I want to tell you the rest cannot be comprehended. The Bible speaks of only one new year for Israel, the new year that begins in Nisan with the Feast of Passover. Notice the words of Exodus 12 too. Speaking of Passover, he says, This month, the month of Nisan, shall be your beginning of month. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Nothing else is said about another new year. Why wouldn't they have kept this new year? And why did God choose Nisan and Passover for the beginning of the Hebrew calendar? There are many reasons behind God's choice. So let us go back to the Word of God and try to understand why this new year. First, one reason why God gave a new calendar to the children of Israel as they were coming out of Egypt is because God didn't want the Israelites to mingle with the idolatrous nations that were present around and in the land of Israel. God wanted to train the Jews to be a priestly nation. So he gave them so many restrictions on food, on garments, and with this, a new calendar to keep them sanctified, to keep them away from the others. But it was changed. In fact, do you know when the Canaanites' New Year's is? It is on the seventh month, in the same month of Tishrei, on Rosh Hashanah, as if Israel did the exact opposite of the commandment. But really, this is not what is important. This change goes much further. What really marked the birth of the nation of Israel is the Passover. After instituting the first month of the year in verse 6 of Exodus 12, more information are given. See what the Lord says. It says, Now you shall keep it, that is the lamb, until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. The same commandment, by the way, is given in Leviticus 23, 4 to 5. Why the 14th of the month? This is when the Israelites sacrificed the Paschal Lamb. The Paschal Lamb is directly connected with the birth of Israel and with the new year. We lost this information. 
See what it says in verse 7. And they shall take some of the blood and put it in the two doorposts of the little of the house where they eat it. So they will be saved from judgment. And this they had to do year after year, temple or no temple. That was a commandment. The Jews had to remember year after year. How come? What happened to this information? Throughout the scriptures, this lamb is connected with what? What did John the Baptist say when he saw the Messiah? He says, behold, the lamb of God. What did John the Apostle see when he saw the Messiah? He said, I saw a lamb as though it had been slain. And it was also Isaiah the prophet that connected the lamb to the Messiah in this great chapter of Isaiah 53, verse 7. Where it says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearer is silent, and he opened not his mouth. This is what was related to the new year as given by God in the Bible. You know, modern Judaism lost the core of the message behind the biblical new year. The real message, I'm going to tell you, is the Messiah himself. The feast of Yom Teruah has become representative of the conflict between rabbinical Judaism and biblical Judaism. And as an extension between man-made religion and the Bible and the scriptures. Very few Jews, very few Jewish people today know that the biblical new year is not on Rosh Hashanah. The problem is that this is foreign to the scriptures because that's a great message for Yom Teruah. Change the new year to any month you want, but do not injure the main message. By the way, this is not hidden. The Bible is open. You do not need to know Hebrew. You do not need to be a scholar. This is very open. This is what Moses said, by the way, to the Israelites before they entered the land in Deuteronomy 30, which is quoted also in Romans. It says, for this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it too far. But it is, the word is very near you and in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. As Jews and as Gentiles who want to find out the truth of things, we ought to go to the root of things. You want to know about Jews? Just go to the account of their creation that we have in our Bible. There you will find out who they are and where they're heading to. You know, I'm amazed by the power of tradition, by the power of religion. People often hold fast to their traditions without having nor demanding Clear explanations about it. And why is tradition so powerful? Because it is easier to follow them than to ask questions. People feel comfortable with history, with tradition. For them, it is like an anchor. And all of this may remind us of other things that they do with the scriptures. It remind us of the story of Christmas, for instance. We're told that three wise men came to see the baby Jesus, but the Bible doesn't say how many wise men there were. And Jesus was not a baby, he was already two years old. It is like the apple that Eve ate and gave to her husband. Who said it was an apple? It doesn't say. And more important, more importantly, we are told Things like God loves the sinner and hates the sin, the Bible does not really say that. It says that the wrath of God is on the sinners. We have to run to them with much love to tell them about their salvation. Even more important, they wrote that Jesus went to preach to the dead. Jesus never went to preach to the dead. He proclaimed victory over their intent to suppress his memory from the earth. How important it is to check the information. This is why we need to go back to the roots and find the truth. It was in his book, Living Proof, where the author, Jim Peterson, noticed that Yeshua, Jesus, spoke about the danger of leaven in pointing to three types of problems, really. Jesus warned the disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, of the Sadducees, and of the leaven of Herod. Leaven symbolizes sin and human imperfection. And so Yeshua was warning against mixing and perfect human ideas with God's truth. The Pharisees had mixed their own religious tradition with the teaching of the scriptures. The Sadducees were the philosophers of Jewish society and mixed all kinds of philosophical ideas to the scriptures. And Herod 
represents the world system. These three influences, tradition, philosophy, and society, seem inevitably to work their way into and becoming part of the value system of any biblical community to such an extent that it is possible to be a believer in God, but live almost entirely within a pagan value system and not even perceive it. Again, we can change things around and beautify them, but the message must remain. The Word of God should not be touched. Let's go back to the Scriptures and see the beauty and the depth of the message of Yom Teruah. Let us begin to see the feasts in general, because when you look at the feasts in general, you can understand them. You have to understand really the flow of one feast to the other in order to understand especially Yom Teruah. Most of us remember this chart. Here are found a beautiful teaching incorporating the two main branches of prophecies. Messianic prophecies with the end time prophecies. These are the two branches of prophecies. The messianic prophecies are divided into two branches. You have the first coming of Jesus and you have the second coming of Jesus. The first coming speaking of his death, resurrection and ascension. And the second coming speaking of him coming as a judge. So he's coming as a savior and coming back as a judge. So this chart concerns not only Israel and the nations of the world, but it concerns each one of us that belong to the body of the Messiah. Because while the church, the body of the Messiah, is not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament, it is in the feast of Israel that it is so strongly alluded. So much so that there are many elements in this feast that you cannot understand unless you bring in the New Testament. Until the body of the Messiah came to be in Acts 2. This is why we have some mystery feasts in there. Let me walk you through this, each of these feasts briefly. And let's connect that strong link between the Messiah, Israel, and the church. One thing that comes out, by the way, in here are the two comings of the Messiah. Something I want to tell you that is so clearly taught in the scriptures. Something that the rabbis ha have even seen. This is why the Talmud came out with the two messiahs, right? They came out with Messiah ben Yosef and Messiah ben David. That is Messiah son of Joseph, son, Messiah son of David. Who they say the Messiah ben Joseph will come if, we are, if there are no good deeds made on the earth. Or Messiah ben David comes if all the Jews make together a, a Shabbat or every Jew starts to give or make some good deeds. But I want to tell you that it is the same Messiah that comes twice. It is Messiah ben David. There's no other Messiah in the scriptures. And Zechariah 12.10 connects the two when he says that when he comes back, the Jews will look upon him and they will see the one what? That they have pierced before. Not only the Jews, but all the nations of the world. As John quotes that passage in the book of Revelation. So we have already touched on the feast of Passover. The Passover was the first and in some respect the most important feast. This is why it began the year in the biblical calendar. This feast happened right at the birth of the nation, Passover. Here two elements play the major role, the blood and the judgment. Blood and judgment. The blood speaks of the deliverance and it comes from the Lamb of God. This blood prevented judgment to fall on those who applied it in their lives. And so right at the outset, we have the plan of salvation. The Lamb typifies the Messiah, Yeshua, whose death and resurrection puts the believer on his way to heaven. What had this feast become in today's Judaism? Nothing like that. When we think of Passover, we think of Matzah. But what about the Lamb that was sacrificed? The most important point, the most important element in this feast was forgotten in time. But the message is clear. It is the message of salvation that the Messiah was to provide for Israel and the nations of the world. The rest of this feast speak about this. They flow from this truth. The second feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which immediately followed the Passover. Again, leaven is a type of sin in the scriptures, and that pointed to the sinlessness of the Messiah because he had to be without sin in order to die for us. It speaks of his sinlessness. 
The third feast is the feast of first fruits. The first fruits in the Bible is a symbol of resurrection. As Daniel the prophet said in Daniel 12:2, it says, Many of those who sleep in the dust, that is, all these Jewish people who sleep in the dust, he says, they will wake up some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. Where are you going? It's the left or the right. This is the word of God. This is the prophet Daniel. Some to everlasting life. Some to everlasting contempt. This is the resurrection of the end spoken of by a Jewish prophet. And how will you know where you'll be going? This is where the feast of first fruits comes. This is where the feast of first fruits will guide you so you can make your proper decision. The feast of first fruits speaks of the resurrection of the Messiah. He is the first fruit. You can be in the group of the second first fruit if you believe in him. In fact, this is the whole plan of salvation right here again. He died for you at Passover, and here he paved the way to heaven for you because he resurrected unto eternal life, and those who believe in him will be the second first fruit. This is what we'll see in the feast today. But the next feast, you have Pentecost of Shavuot that occurs 50 days after Passover, which occurs exactly at the birth of the body of the Messiah in Acts 2. Have you ever wondered who is this group of people composed of Jews and Arabs, of Greeks and Italians, of French and English, all worshipping the same God? This group was born after the resurrection of the Messiah in Jerusalem. It is here in this earth to show you that there's an eternity up there. It is commonly called the church, even though this name includes many, many others. This group of people are Bible believers. It is a company of people linked by the love of God and the hope of an eternity together. This is the group I belong to. And I want to tell you, I will not change it for all the gold in the world. And there's one mystery in the offering of this feast, by the way, in the Old Testament that could not be understood as well. You know, at that time, they offered two breads. This is the first time in the scriptures that bread, leaven bread, was offered. And why two? If you remember, the two leavened breads would represent the Jews and the Gentiles, both sinners offered to God. This is how we can understand it, by linking the fulfillment of this feast in the New Testament and to the Old Testament. These three feasts pointed to the first coming of the Messiah, as you see it in the chart. His death, resurrection, the establishment of the body of the Messiah. The lapse of time between the two sets of feasts represents the time of grace, where we are right now. And the second set has to do with the second coming of the Messiah, which is coming very soon. Then comes Yom Teruach. We will come to this feast very soon. And after this feast comes the feast of the Day of Atonement, that is Yom Kippur where every Jew is required to confess his sins before God. This is not a feast, by the way. It has nothing about celebration or feasting about it. It is a day of affliction. This time represents, in large measure, the work of the Messiah on the cross. And prophetically, it points to that period of time that was spoken by almost all the prophets in the Old Testament and by John and by Jesus and by Paul. That is the day of the Lord, the tribulation time, the seven last years of Daniel that are about to come. This period of time had been completely overlooked and forgotten in modern Judaism and also in many parts of Christianity. We are living as if we're going to implement the millennium ourselves. As the prophecies of the end time are neglected in modern Judaism, so they are neglected in most churches today. Disregarding something does not put an end to it. In fact, almost the whole book of Revelation that was not fulfilled yet is waiting to be fulfilled. And the last feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, that is Sukkot, this feast celebrated by the building of booths or tabernacles to commemorate the 40 years of wilderness wandering. This speaks of the millennium. This speaks of the time when Jesus will come and establish his kingdom on earth. Let's now look at this beautiful Feast of Trumpet. What does it mean? Yom Teruach, why is it a mystery? Why are we not given much information in it in Leviticus? First, the particularity of this feast is the blowing of the trumpet or the shofar. It is a call for all, by the way. This is the word of God, right? 
It is not only for the Jews. It is for Jews and Gentiles. It is a call for all. In the scriptures, scriptures, the blowing of the shofar was done for many different occasions. Joyful ones as well as sad ones. It was a sound of warning as well as victory. It was a sound that called the people's attention towards something big that was about to happen. And second, these trumpets call us to a memorial, it says. A memorial of what? We're not told again. But by seeing its prophetic as aspect, we're going to understand. What is its prophetic fulfillment? The prophetic fulfillment is the rapture. The most extraordinary and the craziest, if you want, doctrine in the Bible. You know, when I first came to believe and they told me about the rapture, I thought they were crazy. <laughs> you know, but there's such a beautiful truth about it. While the rapture is new, its concept, I want to tell you, covers the whole of the scriptures. We find it every time God is about to bring a judgment on the earth. From Noah, where the doors closed before the flood, to Lot, when the angel clearly told them that he was not able to, to bring in a judgment unless he went out. And to Isaiah, actually Isaiah 2620, really defines the concept of the rapture for us. This is what God said to his people when the Babylonians were coming, to his people, the remnant, he says, Come, my people, enter your chambers, and shut your doors behind you, hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation is past. This is the tribulation, indignation for God. This is the rapture. This is what he will tell the believers, those who pondered on his word and saw the message of the Messiah. He will give them these words before the next calamity strikes. This is why the body of the Messiah is nowhere to be found in the book of Revelation, in that part that speaks of the tribulation time. It is not there. I want to bring you to 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, where the rapture actually is explained to us. There's something there that is important. This is what it says. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkle of an eye. At the last trumpet, the last shofar, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall, raise, shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. This is the resurrection of the believers. We are all going to experience a, re a resurrection. This is the teaching of the Bible. And if you happen to be alive on earth at the bodily resurrection of the believers, you are out for the greatest experience, I believe, in all of eternity. It says that in a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, we shall be changed. First the resurrection of the dead, and then you will follow and experience a great change in your body, in your understanding, and you will be fit for your new abode, which is in heaven. That is a wonderful truth that we find here. But did you notice what it says in verse 51? Behold, I show you what? A mystery. I show you a mystery. A mystery in the New Testament is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but is now revealed to us. This mystery explains to us the Feast of Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpet. This is why we are not given much information in Leviticus 23. The answer is here. They could not possibly know the meaning of it because it is here. There's a progressive revelation in the scriptures. The mystery is revealed. Here Paul speaks of it as the last trumpet, the last shofar. It would be the last for the believers that belong in the body of the Messiah that is also spoken of as a mystery, by the way, in Ephesians 3. This is why the church is not spoken of in the Old Testament. The rapture, then, is the revelation of the mystery of Yom Teruach and the fulfillment of this great feast. This is how the books of the Bible are so linked together. This is why when you study prophecy, you have to link one with the other because if you take just one thing here and one thing there and make up your own religion, in fact, this is what happened, this is why we have 3,000 religions in Christianity, then you'll be mixed up. You have to bring in everything. Everything has to concord with all parts of the scriptures. And we cannot speak of the rapture without speaking of the other passage. First Thessalonians chapter 4 
16 to 18 here, it further tells us how the rapture will occur. And notice here how the trumpet or the shofar here is called. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Here's the trumpet, by the way, again. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Here the shofar is called the trumpet of God. It is a direct calling from God himself to his people that compose the body of the Messiah. He's going to call them. In the prophetic calendar of God, the rapture is the next prophecy to occur. Nothing before. And, and this truth should give us enough joy, enough hope to go on strong until our meeting with him. And notice the last word of this prophecy. This is, by the way, I believe the memorial that God calls us today to remember in Yom Teruach. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So beautiful is this doctrine that the Spirit of God tells us to comfort each other with these words, that is, to speak to each other about the soon coming of Yeshua. And this is what I believe is the true Zikaron, the true Yom Teruach, the memorial, the pondering we are called to exercise, therefore comfort one another with these words. And what is really behind this memorial? It's hope. Hope. This is what this, the, this feast speaks about. The hope that should fill the hearts of all believers. The hope that is the driving force behind those who say that they believe in the Messiah. And on the practical level. The question today that this feast brings us to ask ourselves is, what is our hope? What is your hope? Can you live without hope? Surely you have a hope somewhere. What is it? Will it stand the storms? Will it sustain you in hard times? Let's take a time of memorial, as this feast calls us to do, and ponder on hope. And if you are a believer... One of those great things that the Lord has prepared for us is found in the hope that we have in these things. For one thing, we do not have to be knowledgeable in the Bible prophecies to see that the world is advancing towards the end of its age. Watching the news today, we see revolution and discontentment of people who put their trust in men and realize their mistake. We are reminded of the race towards nuclear arms also. How long will it be until a terrorist, a terrorist group, take hold of these nuclear war arms? Wars are literally being fought everywhere. They said that in 2010, they counted some 33 major conflict in just one year. Major, that is. Surely, we need hope. We need a sure hope because the world, I want to tell you, cannot give it to you. We also see that there's a marked decrease of morality and an acceptance of things that were not even spoken of just a few years ago. Even nature seems to go out of hand with those glaciers melting and the weather being more and more difficult to predict. Do we close our eyes to all this until one day it hits us? Where is this going to lead us? I want to bring you to Titus 2.13 where we read of a great two words, blessed hope, the blessed hope. What is the blessed hope? See what it says. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ. The blessed hope is the anticipation of the soon coming of the Messiah, Yeshua. It is the anticipation of another, better world than this one. And the Bible speaks so much about it, I want to tell you. And again, this this was at the core of the belief of men and women in the scriptures as we see see it in Hebrews 11. Do you believe that God exists and that he will come back to establish his kingdom on earth? This is what I believe the shofar is loudly proclaiming to us. This is the zikaron. And true hope is at the base of a blessed life as a believer also. 
Someone has said if you could convince a man that there is no hope, he would curse the day he was born. Hope is an indispensable quality of life. You know, about 20 years ago, I read a book, actually, that really impacted me. This book was written by a Jewish person who went through the Holocaust. His name is Viktor Frankl. He was not a believer. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl tells of his years trapped in horror in Auschwitz. He was transported there like a despised animal, given two minutes to strip naked or be whipped. He was condemned, actually, to a living death. His father, mother, brother, and wife died in the camps and were sent to the gas ovens. His experience was full of cold, fear, starvation, pain, lice, and vermin, exhaustion also, and terror. Franklin wrote that he was able to survive because he never lost, he says, the quality of hope. Those prisoners who lost faith in the future were doomed. When a prisoner lost hope, Frankel, who was also a psychiatrist and a neurologist, said that the prisoner would let himself decline, becoming subject to mental and physical decay. He would die from inside out. Frankel said that this usually happened quite suddenly. One morning, a prisoner would just refuse to get up. He wouldn't get dressed or washed or go outside to the parade grounds. No amount of pleading by his fellow prisoners would help. No threatening by the captors would have any effect. Losing all hope, he had simply given up. He would lay there until he died. You know, American soldiers later told Frankel that this behavior pattern existed also among prisoners of war. He, they called them the give upism. Give upism. When a prisoner lost hope, they said, he lost his spiritual hold. Let me tell you that the Bible will give the hope all human beings need. Because this hope brings us right back to our Creator, right back to our real Father. The Bible is very clear when it says that without God, there's no hope. Not that there's no hope at all, but there's no real hope. This we find in Ephesians 2.12. Ephesians, which speaks about the body of the Messiah. Speaking of those who do not know God through his son, it says that at that time you were without the Messiah, without Christ. All being alien from the commonwealth of Israel and stranger from the covenants of promise, having what? No hope. And without God in the world. Again, it doesn't say that they have no hope. They maybe had some kind of hope somewhere, which in reality, without God, is no hope at all. And God is not that foreign to men, I want to tell you. Whoever we are, we all know God. We can go seek Him, we can go call Him, He will answer. Whether you deny Him or are fighting against Him, I want to tell you, God is real. He's alive. And see what the Bible says to those who know who the Messiah is in 1 Peter 1.3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Yeshua Mashiach from the dead. The us in this verse refers to believers only. They are given the hope that is sure and certain as opposed to other, and it is a living hope, living, right? The Greek word designates something that is alive, that is active. It should be part of our life. This is what the shofar sound actually calls us to, to remember and put your hope in God. Putting your hope in God will not only prepare you for your eternal future, but also for this life. You will function much better. I would like to conclude with one great passage of the Bible that speaks of this hope we all need to take hold of. You know, the rabbis already connected the blowing of the shofar with the collapse of the walls of Jericho. At the time, God ordered seven priests, each with a shofar, to circle the walls of Jericho for six days. And on the seventh day, at the last trumpet, at the last shofar, the walls collapsed. All the walls collapsed except one, remember? Which one was it? It was the wall where the house of Rahab was attached. Because Rahab 
help the Israelite spies her, herself. And so they promised her. Let me read just two verses of this great passage, Joshua 2, verses 18 especially. It says, unless, this is what the spies told Rahab. He says, unless when you come into the land, you bind this cord of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you bring your father, your mother, and your brothers, and all your father's house to your own home, verse 19 says, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the streets, his blood shall be upon his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on your head, if a hand is laid on him. On our head, that is. If a hand is laid on him. So they told Rahab to hang a line of scarlet cord from the window, and if she did that, what it says, that her, her and her family would be saved. Do you know what the Hebrew word for an English word for line or cord is? Now the word in verse 18 that is translated a cord, in this cord of scarlet, this word is the same as hope, tikva, as you have it here. Tikva in Hebrew. And so literally what it means, it says, this hope of red scarlet, you shall hang. Hope of red scarlet. What did it have to be red, by the way? You know, it was not for the Israeli soldiers to, to spare them, because really the Israeli soldiers didn't do anything. It was God who destroyed the walls. The last red sign we and the Israelites have seen before this time was the protective sign of the blood of the Lamb at Passover. This is what they would remember when they would see that red cord, that red hope that hang on the window. Where then is our cord? That is the question of Yom Teruach. Where is our safety cord? I will end with one verse, Isaiah 118, where God speaks to you and says, Come now and let us reason together, says Jehovah. Though your sins are like scarlet, same word, same word as in Yeshua. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And this is only possible if you give your life to Yeshua, and recognize what all that God has done for us through His only begotten Son. Let's bow our head in prayer. Heavenly Father, we serve a God of hope. We worship a living God, and we come to you in His name today, full of thanksgiving and praise, adoration and dedication, singing and praying with joy in our hearts. For what Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, did for us. O oh Lord God, there is no one like you in heaven, above, or on earth below. You are a God of mercy and a keeper of promises. Not even heaven, of the heavens, of the heavens can contain you. Teach us to fear you, teach us to know you, teach us to hand in our heart to you, our minds. And give us the hope that we need so we may go forward. And to the Lord, I pray for the Jewish community as they are, they are celebrating Rosh Hashanah. Lord, I pray, Heavenly Father, that through your words, because they are reading your words in the synagogues, through your word, Lord, I pray that many, many will be touched and come to see that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Jewish Messiah. In his name do we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you all. To get in touch with us, you can do so by telephone, 1-888-685-5902. Locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. You can also reach us through our website at www.arielcanada.com. Again, the phone number is 1-888-685-5902. Or locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. Website address is www.arielcanada, all one word, A-R-I-E-L, Canada.com. Be blessed. Shalom.